Yeah. 
but it's a very important aim because it depicts the Panchatattva. Who knows what the Panchatattva is? That one. Who else knows? Who is the Panchatattva? Come on, I know you're being shy. Okay, we got two. Pancha. Pancha means what? Oh, wow. so we got some people that can count. <laughs> Tatwa. Tatwa means? Truth. Truth. Somebody knew it there. So, these five truths, uh, even though I'm making light of it, this is one of the most important parts of Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita. Uh, as a matter of fact, not this chapter. We're, we're, we're in chapter 6. We're going to be studying from chapter 6. But chapter 7, uh, Srila Prabhupada uh, did something very unique and actually turned this into a, a separate book. This is chapter 7 of Chaitanya Charitamrita. You might have seen it. It's called Lord Chaitanya and Five Features. It's a wonderful book to meditate on, and because Gorapanima is right around the corner, a uh, wonderful book to study. It's not like you have to read the whole Chaitanya Charitamrita. It's like uh, probably 130 pages. Everybody can do that much on the appearance of Lord Chaitanya, right? Yes. Okay, I'll give you another chance later. But anyway, we're going to hear a little bit about it. Vaitacharya, who's one of the most important uh, figures in that uh, painting, transcendental painting. These paintings, also, Srila Prabhupada said, they're, they're windows into the spiritual world. So we get a glimpse of what it might look like. And they're not ordinary canvas to brush type things, but they become very important. Jaya Jaya Sri Chaitanya Jaya Nityananda Jaya Jaya Sri Chaitanya Jaya Nityananda Jaya Dvaita Chandra Jaya Dvaita Bhakta Vrinda Jaya Dvaita Chandra Jaya Dvaita Bhakta Vrinda Jaya Jaya Sri Chaitanya Jaya Nityananda Jaya Jaya Sri Chaitanya Jaya Nityananda Jaya Dvaita Chandra Jaya Yeah. 
Translation by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivinoda Swami Sri Prabhupada. I offer my respectful obeisances to Sri Advaita Jarya, whose activities are all wonderful. By His mercy, even a foolish person can describe His characteristics. Please repeat. I offer my respectful obeisances to Sri Advaita Acharya. Whose activities are all wonderful. By his mercy, even a foolish person can describe his activities. Jaya Jaya Sri Chaitanya Jaya Nityananda Jaya Dvaita Chandra Jaya Gauravanta Vrinda all glories to Lord Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. All glories to Lord Nityananda. All glories to Advaita Acharya. And all glories to all the devotees of Lord Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Pancha Shloke Kahila Sri Nityananda Tatwa Shloka Dwaye Kahi Abha Advaita Charyera Mahatwa Translation in, in five verses I've described the principle of Lord Nityananda Then in the following two verses I described the glories of Sri Advaita Charya Mahavishnur Jagat Karta Mayaya Ya Sri Jat Yada Tasya Vattara Evam Yam Advaita Charya Ishwara Lord Advaita Charya is the incarnation of Mahavishnu whose main function is to create the cosmic world through the actions of Maya. So right away we get our first lesson. Understand who is Advaita Acharya? He is an incarnation of Mahavishnu, whose main function is to create the cosmic world through the actions of Maya. So this verse alone actually defies my paltry intelligence that if you try to explain this verse, what, what are we talking about here? We're talking about the entire cosmic creation. Scientists are mad right now trying to figure out what this world is all about. But here in a very short way, uh, Srila Prabhupada and Krishnadas Kaviraj are giving us in a capsule form, uh, a unique understanding. That is, Lord Advaita Charya is the incarnation of Mahavishnu. We can't fathom Mahavishnu. It's, his description is in the Shastra, so from that we get a glimpse. But we're talking, we're like a speck of sand on the beach, talking about the entire planet. We have no concept, really. We, we hear things and we think we know things, but we have very little understanding. So the Vaishnavas rely solely 
on the transcendental sound vibration coming from the Shastra. Advaitam harina vaitad acharyam bhakti samsana bhaktavataram isham tam advaitacharyam ashraye because he is non-different from Hari, the Supreme Lord, he is called Advaita. And because he propagates the cult of devotion, he is called Acharya. He is the Lord and incarnation of the Lord's devotee. Therefore, I take shelter of him. Because he is non-different from Hari. Who is Hari? Krishna. 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 You're right. Uh, he is called Advaita. So Advaita is someone really who's not different than Krishna. And because he propagates the cult of devotion. What is this cult of devotion? What is it? Are you members of a cult? In English that has such negative connotations. Oh, he's in a cult. He has been brainwashed. Has anyone had their brain washed? How can you? So we know we're speaking figuratively. Wash the brain. It's a total misnomer. It's actually total nonsense uh, to have your brain washed. You can simply be convinced about something because that's what you're interested in. And so when someone wants to mislead you, and you're interested in what he or she is leading you to, then you can be misled, i.e. brainwashed. So uh, this cult of devotion is not like your ordinary, material, mundane, so-called cults. Uh, this cult of devotion is <coughs> referring to all the Vaishnavas of Lord Hari. So that's another reason why he's called Acharya. Now, he is the Lord and incarnation of the Lord's devotee. Therefore, I take shelter of him. So Krishna Das Kaviraj is asking, begging for that, that blessing to take shelter of the Dvaita Acharya. He's not treating him like he's something lesser. Oh, I'm only interested in Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Some people have had that mentality. Even to the point that I'm not so much into the Lord Nityananda. Uh, just Lord Chaitanya is Krishna, that's all I know. Let everything else go. That's a very, very poor and dangerous mentality. To think that uh, one is lesser than the other. Let us continue. Advaita Charya Goshani Sakshat Ishwara Yanhara Mahimanahe Jivera Gochara Sri Advaita Charya is indeed directly the Supreme Personality Godhead Himself. His glory is beyond the conception of ordinary living beings. Hint, we are ordinary living beings. So to think that we can master, actually understand, I know who Advaita Acharya is, we can't fathom it. We have some idea because we're in the Vaishnava society. We have a better idea than most. But uh, it's beyond conception. Not my words, but Krishna Das Kaviraj, his glory. So we can't praise Advaita too much. Just because we say once, Jai Sri Advaita Acharya. You got something on your bank account, but not much. You want to fill that account up with uh, hurry poles and, and jives for your great territory. Maha Vishnu Shisti Karane Jagat Adhikarya Tanra Avatara Sakshara Vaita Acharya. Maha Vishnu performs all the functions for the creation of the universes, plural. Sri Advaita Charya is his direct incarnation. So all the universes is beyond us. 
We can't, even the one we're in, we got trouble with that. And even trying to understand the planet Earth. How many people here have actually been around the so-called whole planet Earth? Circumambulated the whole planet Earth. So far, no one. How many people have visited at least, I'll be modest, 50 cities on the planet Earth? 50 places on planet Earth. We got one here. <coughs> So we got some Jagat gurus here to tell us about the planet Earth. But the point I'm making is that we understand very little about even where we live. If you, if you would ask me right now, of course I'm embarrassed, but I'll embarrass myself. I've been living in the same house for some 26, almost 25 years. If you ask me my neighbors, name, and they've lived there a little longer than me, I couldn't call his name. That's sad. I don't know, we say hello, good morning, whatever, all the time, but we don't associate. I don't know what their program is. They don't really know what my program is. It's a sad situation. But yet we think we know something. So with me, I don't even know my own neighbors, so to speak. Yet we think we know something about the universe, about the city, about creation. So we don't. That's established. We're continuing. Ye Barusha Shisti Shisti Karane Karena Mayai Ananta Brahmanda Shisti Karane Na Lilaya. That Purusha creates and maintains his external, with his external energies. He creates innumerable universes in his pastime. So now we're beginning at least to see some of why he's saying uh, Advaita Charya is unfathomable. He creates many universes to have pastimes. Ichaya Ananta Murti Karena Prakasha Eka Eka Murti Karena Brahmande Parvesha. By his will, he manifests himself in unlimited forms in which he enters each and every universe. So Sri Advaita Charya is everywhere. It's not just here, in our little realm. The, the planet Earth, where we are, our universe is one of the smallest ones because uh, the head of this particular universe, Lord Brahma, uh, only has four heads uh, to look in the four directions. Uh, and he manages, he's, he's known as the universal engineer. But there are large Brahmas with hundreds of heads, even thousands of heads to manage those universes. Some universes require a Brahma with millions of heads. So we can't even fathom that because we got one head. We cannot fathom what it means to have millions of heads. Later in this Chaitanya Charitamrita, uh, Krishna calls all the Lord Brahmas to his residence and they all appear and they all offer obeisances simultaneously. And it said millions of helmets, crowns, hit the floor and made a tumultuous sound. They all immediately, because they only saw Krishna and not the other Brahma, so they all immediately paid obeisances and this sound was, I can't even imagine, I'd like to hear it, but uh, we can't imagine. And each Lord Brahma simply asked Krishna, why have you called me? And Krishna just said, I wanted to see you. But what he was doing was showing to our Lord Brahma, the four-headed Brahma, that he's not the only one in this universe. There are many, many millions of universes with a Lord Brahma in charge of each one. 
back to this verse, what we're hearing is that Sri Advaita Acharya manifests himself in all of these universes. Se purushera amsha advaita nahi kichubera sharira vishesha tandra nahi ka vishera. Sri Advaita Charya is a plenary part of that Purusha and so is not different from him. Indeed, Sri Advaita Charya is not separate but is another form of that Purusha. Sahaya karena tanra raiya pradhana koki pramanda karena kichaya nirmana. He, Advaita Jaya, helps in the pastimes of the Purusha, with whose material energy and by whose will he creates innumerable universes. Jagat Mangala Advaita Mangala Guna Dhamma Mangala Charitra Sada Mangala Yandra Dhamma Being a reservoir of all auspicious attributes, Sri Advaita Charya is all auspicious for the world. His characteristics, activities, and names are always auspicious. Her word. Sri Advaita Prabhu who is an incarnation of Mahavishnu, is an acharya, or teacher. All his activities and all the other activities of Vishnu are auspicious. Anyone who can view the all auspiciousness in the pastimes of Lord Vishnu also becomes auspicious simultaneously. Therefore, since Lord Vishnu is the fountainhead of auspiciousness, Anyone who is attracted by the devotional service of Lord Vishnu can render the greatest service to the human society. Rejected persons of the material world who refuse to understand pure devotional service as the eternal function of the living entity and as actual liberation of the living being from conditioned life become bereft of all devotional service because of their poor fund of knowledge. Any questions this far into the purport? And the Prabhupada is explaining just very succinctly, very deeply. If you can understand the auspiciousness of Sri Advaita Charya, we, you, we can enter into what it means to be really auspicious. What is something that is auspicious? What does auspicious mean? What does auspicious mean? Something that's auspicious. To get restored in our spiritual, like to get uh, uh, restored in our spiritual life, I mean, uh, uh, to come out of the condition we like. Yeah, to some degree. Uh, we brought in the word spiritual, but some people might not want to hear what spiritual is. So what is something auspicious? Of course, that's, that's the real. Your definition is actually the real. But just, I'm trying to focus on what auspicious means. Something favorable. Something favorable. Positive. Favorable. Something good, favorable. Something that's going to make you feel good even, uh, auspicious. And then back to the real, bringing in the spiritual quality, the spiritual aspect of something that is auspicious means it has nothing to do with the material world we live in. So when you do an auspicious spiritual activity, like chanting Hare Krishna, like giving the Lord some fruits, some flowers, some boga, your time, all of that is auspicious. If you uh, do, do those activities with the aim of simply pleasing Krishna, that's auspicious. Uh, so these auspicious activities are what devotees are known to perform. 
Anyone who doesn't perform them, Srila Prabhupada sums up this paragraph with they have a poor fund of knowledge. You can see, you know, 98, 99% of the population is not interested in performing real auspicious activities. If that were the case, uh, just from Atlanta, just from the inner circles of Atlanta, we would have to build a bigger temple. If there are 6 million people in Atlanta, we got maybe 200 here today. We got work to do. Where's the rest of our brothers and sisters? They're not here. They're not doing things that are auspicious. They've dialed in the big screen to the playoff. Some of you might know that today is the so-called Super Bowl. The real Super Bowl, we're in it right now. The real bowl of superior activities is right here. That's why there's only a couple of hundred people at most here. But if you go to the stadium, uh, I don't know where, where they're doing it today. If you go there, you're going to see millions because they're trying to enjoy it. So we are, we're not criticizing their enjoyment. Let them enjoy it. It's the nature of the living being to enjoy it. But real enjoyment comes back to what we're talking about. Understanding what's really auspicious. So though a particular sport, a particular game might be fun, it's temporary. It's temporary fun. Just like you can go across the street and kick your soccer ball around for a couple of hours. Wow, we had some fun. It was fun. It was nice. But after that, what happens? You're tired, sweaty, hungry. So was that really auspicious? Did it help you? Maybe a little physical activity, but that's it. So let's get back into the essence of this subject matter. The teachings of Advaita Prabhu, in the teachings of Advaita Prabhu, there is no question of fruitive activities or impersonal liberation. Again, that's why it's auspicious to know who Advaita Acharya is. To hear anything about him is auspicious. Bewildered by the spell of the material energy, however, persons who could not understand that Advaita Prabhu is non different from Vishnu wanted to follow him with their impersonal conceptions. So Srila Prabhupada is taking a certain angle here uh, because impersonalism is very dangerous. Uh, and this is what has been attributed to Advaita Prabhu, but it's not the fact. The attempt of Advaita Prabhu to punish them is also auspicious. Lord Vishnu and his activities can bestow all good fortune, directly and indirectly. In other words, being favored by Lord Vishnu and being punished by Lord Vishnu are one and the same because all the activities of Vishnu are absolute. According to some, Mangala was another name of Advaita Prabhu as the causal incarnation of Lord Vishnu's incarnation for a particular occasion. He is the supply agent or ingredient in material nature. However, he is never to be considered material. All his, his activities are spiritual. Anyone who hears about and glorifies him becomes glorified himself. For such activities free one from all kinds of misfortune. One should not invest any material contamination or impersonalism in the Vishnu form. Everyone should try to understand the real identity of Lord Vishnu. For by such knowledge one can attain the highest stage of perfection. So Srila Prabhupada steers us, us away from getting involved in anything impersonal. Uh, and certainly misunderstanding Sri Advaita Charya as the impersonal incarnation of Lord Vishnu. Meaning he, he was a physical form, uh, something material. That is not the case. Advaita Charya is always spiritual. So we don't want to misunderstand what is there in the Shastra?
And Srila Prabhupada is careful here as throughout Srimad Bhagavatam, he makes it eminently clear. Anytime impersonal concepts spring up, he clears the stage through his purports. Very important. Because as Kali Yuga progresses, impersonalism is also progressing, even though we might not see it. It is progressing, this kind of activity. So, just like uh, when we come into the temple, we leave our shoes outside. We don't bring that in. In the same manner, we should actually also leave our mind outside, our material mind. Because the material mind is polluted, just like uh, our shoes. We don't want to track in all the nonsense. So using this analogy, yes, we want to leave our material concepts, our material speculations, the other side of the door. Uh, because we want to focus on Krishna. Uh, and to do that, we don't need any material distractions. Any questions on this latter part? Mahavishnu creates the entire material world with millions of his parts, energies, and incarnations. Double Loka. Maya yache duyamsha nimita upadana, maya nimita hetu upadana pradana, purusha nishwar aiche vi murti hayat iya, nishwa shristi kare nimita upadana lakna. Translation. Just as the external energy consists of two parts, the efficient cause, nimitta, and the material cause, upadhana. Maya being the efficient cause, and pradhana, the material cause. So Lord Vishnu, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, assumes two forms to create the material world with the efficient and material causes. Purport. There are two kinds of research to find the original cause of creation. One conclusion is that the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the all-blissful, eternal, all-knowing form, is indirectly the cause of this cosmic manifestation, and directly the cause of the spiritual world, where there are innumerable spiritual planets, known as Vaikuntas as well as his personal abode, known as Goloka Vrindavan. In other words, there are two manifestations, the material cosmos and the spiritual world. In the material world, there are innumerable planets and universes. So, in the spiritual world, there are also innumerable spiritual planets and universes, including the Vaikuntas and Goloka. The Supreme Lord is the cause of both the material and spiritual worlds. The other conclusion, of course, is that this cosmic manifestation is caused by an inexplicable, inexplicable, unmanifested void. This argument is meaningless. So Srila Prabhupada very sharply cuts it like an axe. The so-called Big Bang Theory has just been smashed. All of you know what the Big Bang is, right? We live in this world where science is dominating thought. And they, when, when you ask them about how, how was this world created? How did all this get, get going? And they will tell you, in the beginning there was some explosion. They call this explosion a, a singularity. What is a singularity? A unique one-time incident. How ridiculous. 
because anyone in, in kindergarten can understand better than that. So there was absolutely nothing. Imagine, we can't even really imagine it. We try to imagine absolutely nothing. So there's nothing. And then there's a big bang. How do we get the bang? Raise your hands, don't be shy. Tell me, how did you get this bang? Because when you get a bang, you hear something and you, there's a cause. What's this cause? Me slapping my hands. Hello, are you out there? Hello, world. <laughs> so how did this happen? There was nothing. There was absolutely nothing. And then at one point, singularity, there was this big bang. I don't see any hands trying to explain this. But don't even waste your time. We know better. Because there was no such singularity. But this is their only way to circumambulate what actually happens, uh, which they don't know. This type of inquiry uh, from bottom up, known uh, especially in science, whereas the devotees get information top down. So inquiring uh, through their own speculative experiments is the so-called science. But it's not real science, because science, the very word, by definition, means to know. Science means to know, coming from the Greek and the Latin. So if you don't know how the world was activated, what you're doing is not necessarily science. You're saying it's science. It's science for us to probe. How can that be science? You have to know. If you ask a young child, where is your mother? They already know. They'll point. Here, here, there. where's your father? They know. But if the little child has to go out into the world and explore person by person, is this your mother? No. Is this your mother? No. What a waste of time. But science is using this approach to say, in the beginning, something happened. Uh, and they, they want you to take it as a given. There was some type of matter, right? There was some type of matter. That's how we had the explosion. So let's grant them matter. What is matter? Matter means something physical, some type of form, something. Let's take as an example a huge rock. There's a huge rock. That's matter and it's just floating in space. And then at some point, there was an explosion. And from that explosion, life forms began to develop. Now I just caused you to jump an ocean. You should have so many questions. Where did the life forms come from? What were the life forms like? What caused the explosion? So back to page one, we see it just doesn't work. Of course, I'm, I'm not a so-called scientist, and they can use, their vocabulary is way better than mine. They can explain all their concepts very technically, and they can sweet wash it very nicely. But if you ask them simply, well, how did it happen? Uh, they can't explain. And better yet, there's an English word in every language, there's this word, why? A young child always asks the parents, if you tell a young child, I want you to sit in this big chair because it's, it's comfortable. And he says, why? I don't want to sit in that chair. So if you tell a young child anything, usually they respond with why, especially when they're learning, that learning stage. The learning stage should continue throughout our lives, but, you know, here and there it gets kind of muddled in the carcass that we're in. But back to the point, the question, why? Why do we behave like we behave? Oh, now we can get into psychology. Many answers are there. How did psychology develop? Or my favorite approach, how did this uh, fish that Mr. Darwin saw flipping up on the shore decide that it would be better to have legs
hands and feet and walk on the land rather than swimming in the ocean. There's more food available on the land. How, did, how does a fish know that? It just doesn't happen by next, tomorrow I'll have legs and things develop. No, they say it took millions of years. So when you examine all these scientific concepts, you can see there's a fault everywhere. How, so where are the examples of skeletons that almost became humans, but didn't, didn't develop as a human being? Where, where are they? Fish that they were some kind of fish in the beginning, and then something else later on. Where are the skeletons that would indicate that? There aren't any. There's no so-called evolution in the Darwin sense. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta explains evolution in the uh, Vaishnava understanding. And he says, if all of you can't see this, but this painting here has the ten primary incarnations of Lord Krishna. But he explains evolution by uh, saying that actually evolution, there is evolution of our consciousness in serving Krishna. So Matsya is the fish incarnation. During that time period, the way for service was through Matsya. That's an incarnation of Krishna. We don't get much in our current Bhagavatam on this. There's some little, but any of those incarnations you pick out, you can, you can read in Srimad Bhagavatam what happened during that era. So the evolution is simply an evolution in the way we serve Krishna. And uh, when we get to uh, the, the third from the bottom, from the right, on the right hand side, we see Krishna and Balaram, perhaps the sweetest way to serve Krishna in the forest of Vrindavan in Goloka. If you want to know what Golok Vrindavan is, read the uh, Brahma Samhita. I believe it's, it's text 38, or I forget the exact number. But in that purport uh, is a six or seven page explanation on uh, Goloka and Golok Vrindavan. What, what is the difference between Gokul and Golok Vrindavan? And uh, in summary, Bhaktisiddhanta says, actually there is no difference. But for the sake of our understanding, five pages he gives us in how we can understand Gokula, where Krishna manifested on this planet, and Golok Vrindavan, where Krishna eternally is. Uh, in my tiny concept of seeing things, I can only try to surmise from having read it uh, and tell you that the Gokula manifested by Krishna in our realm, Vrindavan, is no different than Goloka. And that everything that is in Goloka was there in Gokula. Our problem comes from our material body. We can't see how you can uh, mount 20 elephants on the top of a pinhead. Krishna can do that. Krishna can put 20 elephants on the top of a head of pin. How small is a pinhead? Everybody knows it's very tiny. Or a, one, one uh, strand of your hair. For me, it's very difficult to get one strand I can't find it, but imagine one strand, you pull it out, and the jiva, us, we are 100,000 part of the tip of one hair. So from where we sit now, that seems like very small, I can't even imagine it. That's the jiva. But we're talking, what is the material realm where, where we live and the spiritual? So there's no distinction between Goloka and Gokula, save and except Krishna decided to manifest Goloka in Gokula. And that's how we're being saved to this very day, because Krishna manifested Goloka to Gokula. Any questions?
before we finish up. Factually, the Supreme Absolute Spirit Soul is the cause of every kind of manifestation. And he's always complete both in the energy and as the energetic. The cosmic manifestation is caused by the energy of the Supreme Absolute Person in whom all energies are conserved. Philosophers who are subjectively engaged in the cosmic manifestation can appreciate only the wonderful energies of matter. Big Bang. Such philosophers accept the conception of God only as a product of the material energy. We dreamed it up. We need some crutch to lie on. According to their conclusion, the source of the energy is also the product of the energy. Such philosophers wrongly observe that the living creatures within the cosmic manifestation are caused by the material energy. They think that the supreme absolute conscious being must similarly be a product of the material energy. Since materialistic philosophers and scientists are too much engaged in their imperfect senses, naturally, they conclude that the living force is a product of the material combination. But the actual fact is just the opposite. Matter is a product of spirit. According to Bhagavad Gita, the Supreme Spirit, the personality of Godhead, is the source of all energies. When one advances in research work by studying the limited substance within the limits of space and time, one is amazed by the various wonderful cosmic manifestations. And naturally, one goes on hypothetically accepting the path of research work, research work or the inductive method. Through the deductive way of understanding, however, one accepts the supreme absolute person, the personality of Godhead as the cause of all causes, who is full with diverse energies and who is neither impersonal nor void. What does Lord Brahma say? Ishwara Parama Krishna Sakti Nanda Vigra Anadi Radhi Govinda Sarva That's Krishna. The impersonal manifestation of the Supreme Person is another display of his energy. Therefore, the conclusion that matter is the original cause of creation is completely different from the real truth. The material manifestation is caused by the glance of the Supreme Personality of Godhead who is inconceivably potent. Material nature is electrified by the Supreme Authority and the conditions all with the limits of time, within the limits of time and space is trapped by all of the material manifestation. In other words, the Supreme Personality of Godhead is actually realized in the vision of a material philosopher and scientist through the manifestations of his material energy. For one who does not understand the power of the Supreme Personality of Godhead or his diverse energies because of not knowing the relationship between the source of the energies and the energies themselves. There is always a chance of error, which is known as Vivarta. As long as the materialistic scientists and philosophers do not come to the right conclusion, certainly they will hover above the material field, bereft of proper understanding of the absolute truth. The great Vaishnava philosopher, Srila Baladev Vidyarusha, has very nicely explained the materialistic conclusion in his Govinda Vasya, a commentary on the Vedanta Sutra. He writes as follows, the Sankhya philosopher Kapila has connected the different elementary truths according to his own opinion. Material nature, according to him, consists of the equilibrium of the three material qualities, goodness, passion, and ignorance. Material nature produces the material energy, known as Mahat and Mahat produces a false ego. The ego produces the five objects of sense perception, which produce the ten senses, five for acquiring knowledge and five for working, the mind and the five gross elements. Counting the Purusha, or the enjoyer, with these 24 elements, there are 25 different truths. The non-manifested stage of these 25 element, elementary truths is called Prakriti 
or material nature. The qualities of material nature can be associated in three different stages, namely as the cause of happiness, the cause of distress, and the cause of illusion. The quality of goodness is the cause of material happiness. The quality of passion is the cause of material distress. And the quality of ignorance is the cause of illusion. Our material experience lies within the boundaries of these three manifestations of happiness, distress, and of illusion. For example, a beautiful woman is certainly a cause of material happiness for one who possesses her as a wife. But the same beautiful woman is the cause of distress for a man whom she rejects, or whom is the cause of her anger. And if she leaves a man, she becomes the cause of illusion. Two kinds of senses are the ten, the two kinds of senses are the ten external senses and the one internal sense, the mind. Thus there are eleven senses. According to Kapila, material nature is eternal and all-powerful. Originally there is no spirit, and matter has no cause. Matter itself is the chief cause of everything. It is all pervading, the all-pervading cause of all causes. The Sankhya philosophy regards the total energy, Mahatattva, the false ego, and the five objects of sense perception as the seven diverse manifestations of material nature, which has two features known as material cause and efficient cause. The Purusha, the enjoyer, is without transformation, whereas material nature is always subject to transformation. But although material nature is inert, it is the cause of enjoyment and salvation for many living creatures. Its activities are beyond the conception of sense perception, but still one may guess at them by superior intelligence. Material nature is one, but because of the interaction of the three qualities, it, is, it can produce the total energy and the wonderful cosmic manifestation. Such transformations divide material nature into two features, namely the efficient and material causes. The Purusha, the enjoyer, is inactive and without material qualities, although at the same time he is the master existing separately in each and every body as the emblem of knowledge. By understanding material cause, one can guess that the Purusha, the enjoyer, being without activity, is aloof from all kinds of enjoyment or superintendence. Sankhya philosophy, after describing the nature of Prakriti, material nature, and the Purusha, the enjoyer, asserts that the creation is only a product of their unification or proximity to one another. So basically, even though I subjected you to this long purport, we can forget it because you will see when we continue, uh, which will have to be next class, when we continue, this Sankhya philosophy is not propounded by Krishna consciousness. Because in a nutshell, what they are doing is saying that uh, things did come, the, the original cause was something material. And that's how the world is operating. And that uh, through this so-called material nature, then these three basic activities take place. And we're either in the mode of goodness, passion, or ignorance. So because of time, we have to stop at this point. Uh, we, we will continue this at another time. This is a very in-depth subject matter. And I would uh, encourage everybody, you'll have a little time during this month, and certainly ne up next month as the appearance of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu himself. But during this time, to go into the Chaitanya Charitamrita and take a little of this nectar. And if possible, distribute it to others. Any questions before I go? Arjuna. Um, auspicious actual deep meaning. <laughs> Nitto Shuddho, Nitto Mukto. Nitto Shuddho means eternally pure. And Nitto Mukto means eternally uh, free from all material clutches. Free from harm. Jai. Very much uh, appreciate the nectar there. The Prabhupada Ki.
Mother is always saying, and I will keep them. I will go on a sloka. The beautiful program for the children to learn Kirtan and memorizing Kirtan sloka. And the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna Bhagavad Gita. So I like to honor the Sunday fish party. So one can not have any fish come forward. Shumankarnath and they sponsored Sunday feast for their father, late Sunil Chandra Nath, and also late Radha Rani Shem. And in memory of their father, Sunil Chandra Nath, and they are seeking the blessings from all the Vaishnavas for their departed families. So can you pray for this wonderful family? So Shogunath actually he does this every year. He does this for his father. Uh, celebrates their memories of their family in the temple here. It's so a very nice seva. So we offer all the that we cook, we offer to the deities and they offer to serve Prasadam to everyone. This is another very nice way to observe holidays, you know, like memories, birthday. This is a very nice way to do it. You feel so many Vaishnavas and devotees. And you get so much blessings of the deities and the Vaishnavas. So let's pray for this family by raising our hand, chanting one time Hare Krishna loudly. Hare Krishna! Hare Krishna! Krishna! Then we have uh, Sarup Das, disciple of Ramapad Maharaj. Actually, they live in Alachua, close to the temple, but they sponsor the Sunday feast here for seeking the blessings of all the devotees while they are traveling in India. So, can you pray for this wonderful family? Hare Krishna! Hare Krishna! Krishna! Hare Krishna! Hare Hare! Third, we have Mohan Patel and family. They are sponsoring Sunday feast for their departed family members. So let's pray also for this wonderful family, Mohan Patel. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So now let me call. Ramesh Penton family, please come forward. I saw them there. So Ramesh Penton family, they are sponsoring Sunday feast to celebrate their daughter Sahana Penton's second birthday. They are also doing a very beautiful thing. Sahana Penta. We say Sahana. We chant Happy Birthday. Can you remember? Sahana. So you can chant Happy Birthday. Happy Birthday. Krishna Kansas devotee, can you pray for her? Yeah. One time chanting more, one time chanting more Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Krishna Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare. So we have a cake, 
So now she's going to come the cake. She says, we chant three times Hari Bol loudly. And she does the cake. Hari Bol!
have Layla family, they have donated $5,000 for the roof replacement. So let's chant one time Hare Krishna for this wonderful family. Anand Dalvi and family, they have donated $2,000 for the replacement of the roof. Let's chant one time Hare Krishna for them also. Then we have four. Dimpul, Koyiman, Mujidhar family, they have donated $500 for the roof. Let's chant one time Hare Krishna for them also. Starting work from tomorrow, so they will only at least they will take only three days to finish this replacement of the roof, and then Krishna will have a new roof, and then I don't think there will be any more rainfall because I know the front door there is so much rain coming down. We just put a new wood, and then in the puja room, in the kitchen, sometimes it leaks out in the office. So hopefully it will stop, uh, and then Krishna will have a new roof. So let's, it's a very good endeavor for the temple to do this task because I think in 2006 we have replaced the roof. So far we haven't done it. It's almost what, 15, 16 years? Huh? 18. 18 years. So we're doing after 18 years. It's a very nice endeavor for the temple to do this. Serve to Radha Madan Mohan so that we can, the temple can have a new roof. A roof. And then the temple is also working on the public bathroom, means the guest bathroom. Very soon we'll start the bathroom work for the guest. Uh, but there are discussions going on that we may have a bathroom outside instead of doing inside. We may have it outside. But it's still because that is still in a limbo because until we get a permit from the city, we cannot do it. So as soon as we get the permission, our weather server, our camp president is working on it. Let's see how soon he can work on it and then we can do a, we can have a nice beautiful bathroom for the guests and members and devotees outside, not inside. And this can be used for the temple residents or for other guest members, but we have a very beautiful bathroom outside. So if it doesn't happen, then we will we'll run away this bathroom. Here. So the temple has done now, new kitchen is done, we have a new men's bathroom upstairs and the whole Brahmachari Ashram has been newly painted. Now we build a new roof, so slowly some work is progressing. So let's thank the Iskon Atlanta Temple Management for being this seva to all our community. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Krishna Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama. Also on the month of April, we have international Kirtan Mela. We just had one in January. There was only Kirtan Mela for our congregation devotees, local congregation. But every year we do Kirtan Mela for with international devotees. So this will be April 19th, 20th and 21st. And so you can pencil those dates in your calendar so you can take care of your time and you can participate in Kirtan. You don't have to do nothing. You just come here. Attend Kirtan and take Prasad and dance and chant and be happy. I know people go for, especially nowadays for Kirtan Mela, people are traveling from all over the world, going to different parts of the country for hearing Kirtan. But here, and they have to also pay money, they have to book their tickets and all that. But you come here, it's everything free, you just come and chant with us for the praise of Radha Madan Mohan, Gauritai, Jagannath, Prasupatra Maharani and Prabhupada and take Prasad and be happy. We will give you more updates on Kirtan as the day comes near. And also we will be, I think Lakshman is arranging some beautiful Kirtan here from different parts of the world. They will be here and they will change with us. Hare Krishna. Any other announcements? Okay, so we will have Prashadam. Prashadam will be serving inside. You can all come and take the final dash of the deities. Uh.
Don't forget to say Ghana Sample if you have a time. This topic is Ghana Sample. Very good.